with an NIH research award, I believe. And she worked there as a joint student between Andrew Ward and Artem Patapuchin. So Artem, you might have heard of recently. He got the Nobel Prize in Medicine with others uh, in 2021. And together she was working on solving structures of ion channels. So the piezo and, and swell one uh, structures were her major contributions during her PhD and initial uh, postdoc studies there. And so she had a, a lot of interest in ion channels that sense the osmotic changes and the mechanical properties of, of membranes and had a, a lot of biophysical um, and structural aspects of membrane tension and of course cryo-EM experience as well. So I, you can imagine how thrilled I was when Jennifer applied to, to my lab. I've just seen Artem give a talk here uh, a few weeks before her application and uh, I don't know what you did, but uh, your application was followed up by an email and then a very insistent phone call from Gabe Lander, also telling me I would be an idiot not to take you in the lab. So it was really, I was left with no choice, even if I had a difference of opinion. But, but of course, I was uh, extremely happy to have uh, Jennifer. So this was part of a, a change in my group as well, where we really wanted to become more structure oriented. So this was part of that those efforts, those conscientious efforts that I was making to, to kind of take my, my group in a different direction as well. Um, so Jennifer did arrive January 1st, 2020, not the best time to start a postdoc, uh, but uh, nevertheless has, has made really uh, kind of dramatic findings in the lab. Uh, we had uh, a few false starts in the beginning. We chased down a amazing structure that turned out to be a, a contaminating virus in our, in our prep, but I think those days are behind us now. And, uh, uh, Jennifer will tell you about her, her recent work with isosome structures, and what's particularly interesting is how these structures capture native lipids in, in sufficient structural density, uh, definition that we can see where these lipids are in a, in a native membrane. So just on a final note, I'd like to say it's been a, a great pleasure to have another native English speaker in, in the group. <laughs> Although it's been a bit tricky for me being as politically correct as I need to be with an American group. But I, I, think, <laughs> I think we both kind of met in the middle in that regard to some extent. So without further ado, I'll add to the floor to you, Jen. Thanks, Robbie. Thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, as he said, we had some false starts and actually the project I'm going to present was somebody else's false start, but I think we made something interesting of this kind of accidental discovery also. So I'm going to start with a controversy, maybe, yes. So I learned in my, uh, oopsie, I have, no, no, I can't. I can only go behind it. It it uh, it goes behind the box. But I'm afraid to. <laughs> Escape this mode, and I think it'll be fine. <laughs> it wasn't showing up in the, the mouse. Screen. Screen. <laughs> uh, Let me go to this one. Let's see. I got it. Oh no, it's a different PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> well, that kind of stole my thunder. <laughs> Do you guys in Zoom see a presentation? You see a second slide? You guys see a second slide? All right. Okay, so I wanted to begin with a controversy. <laughs> so I learned in my Intro to Cell Biology course that, and maybe you did too, 
that membranes are divided into functional compartments containing specific lipids and proteins that organize cellular events like endocytosis and signaling. Uh, the compartments are termed lipid rafts or membrane microdomains. Although they were first described in 1973, their structure, composition, and their very existence remains controversial to this day. So the lipid raft hypothesis started from the observation that there are detergent resistant parts of the membrane that are enriched in sterols, single lipids, and lipidated proteins. The idea is that a preferential interaction between cholesterol and saturated lipids drives a phase separation within the membrane. And this phase separation can be used by the cell to organize uh, proteins and, and biochemistry. This phase separation has been observed many times in lipid mixtures in vitro with saturated lipids and sterols forming lipid ordered domains and unsaturated lipids forming lipid disordered domains. An, an alternative theory, or perhaps just a complexity that's present in bio biological membranes, is that lipid phase separation in the membrane is driven by lipid protein interactions. For example, the binding of actin cytoskeletal proteins to lipids or the formation of a lipidated protein scaffold. So the main reason that the lipid raft controversy has persisted for so long is due to the difficulty of visualizing lipids without disrupting their behavior. So if you label a lipid at its hydrophobic tail, you risk disrupting the normal interactions that it has with the surrounding lipids and also maybe the interactions it has with integral membrane proteins. <clears throat> On the other hand, if you label it at the head group, you risk disrupting the interactions between lipid binding proteins and the lipid or conversely uh, with, um, if you try and label <clears throat> from the outside uh, with a, like a, for example, a membrane flare, you will miss any lipids that are currently bound. So the limitation in the, in the tools to study lipids in their context have made this rather intuitive idea of membrane self-organization very difficult to prove. So one relatively well-studied example of a membrane microdomain is the yeast isosome. Isosomes are stable plasma membrane invaginations found in most fungal species. In S. cerevisiae, there are around 300 nanometers in length and 50 nanometers deep and randomly distributed throughout the membrane. The paralogous proteins P1 and LSP1 were found to be the proteins that scaffold these isosome invaginations. You can see their punctate pattern in these confocal microscopy images. Subsequently, several other protein families have been identified that either transiently or stably associate with the isosomes, including some signaling proteins and some nutrient transporters. So the isosome scaffold proteins, PIL1 and LSP1, are bar domain proteins. It's an interesting family of proteins that are involved in memory, many membrane modifying processes, like endocytosis and cell migration. The bar proteins have a characteristic crescent or banana shape, and they function to either sense and or drive membrane curvature. Um, and they do this through their binding and oligomerization. Um, from the structure, from the crystal structure of LSP1, you can see that it has this banana shape as well. And it also has highly, uh, highly charged patches on the membrane facing surface, which is characteristic of many bar proteins. Some additional low resolution structures from the same year um, using helical reconstruction showed the lattice organization of the PIL1 and LSP1 proteins. And these structures were solved by incubating proteins with uh, liposomes containing PIP2, which both PIL1 and LSP1 can bind and tubulate. So the isosomes are a striking structural feature of the yeast, but what is their function? So this has also been pretty controversial. They were initially characterized as stalled sites of endocytosis, but this was later disproven. Um, they've been shown to form these stable lipid microdomains that are enriched in PIP2 single lipids and sterols, though I've already mentioned why it's difficult to say that uh, without an asterisk. It's also been proposed that they're functionally analogous to cavioli in, in mammalian cells, but most evidence to date supports the notion that they're actually membrane stress sensors. So under steady state conditions, the isosome sequester 
these proteins that I've mentioned before, including um, SLIM1 and 2, which are TORC2 uh, signaling proteins, the APC nutrient transporters, and some tetraspanin family proteins, including NC102. So under various types of membrane stress, like hypoosmotic stress, heat shock, mechanical pressure, isosomes appear to flatten and sequestered proteins are released from the isosomes, which are then enabled to do their signaling functions. For example, SLIM1 goes to TORC2, um, which is then able to phosphorylate its substrate YPK1. And YPK1 goes on to initiate a bunch of processes that then uh, feedback on on membrane, uh, plasma membrane homeostasis, including single lipid biosynthesis, glycerol efflux, and sterile transport. But how the isosomes are able to sense membrane stress and transduce it to its uh, resident proteins is not known. So there are actually several really difficult open questions to answer about how the isosomes function as membrane stress sensors. And so far, as I've mentioned, we've been limited by the tools that exist to study uh, membranes. So first, we want to know what is the composition of the isosome microdomain. We have this weak evidence from in vivo lipid probes, but defining the composition of a subcompartment is super difficult. Second, it would be really interesting to understand the molecular determinants of how PIL1 and LSP1 can create a membrane microdomain. And of course, we're really interested to know how the isosome microdomain functions as a membrane stress sensor. Um, as I mentioned, we did not in fact set out to answer any of these questions. Um, our structural studies of isosomes began as an accident. They were not our intended structural target. <laughs> but as Robbie mentioned, I think we have a really unique opportunity here to investigate the native arrangement of a plasma membrane microdomain because of these samples that we accidentally got. So the structures that I will show you are fully native, totally untagged, endogenously expressed proteins. And Robbie's lab has been using a pretty unique uh, protein biochemistry that has previously enabled the solution of several uh, large super complexes involved in signaling, including the toroid and the C complex. So this project started with Ming, who is a recently graduated PhD student from Robbie's lab. And he was optimizing conditions for TORC2 purification. So these are the features of his optimized prep that I think enabled the isolation of these isosomes with their membrane uh, still attached. So he used this endogenous tap tag on bit 61, which is a TORC2 subunit, so there was no protein overexpression. He hand ground the yeast, the frozen yeast under liquid nitrogen. And then throughout his prep, he used CHAPS detergent below critical micelle concentration, which I think enabled um, the, the lipid to remain attached to the protein. Uh, we never use gel filtration that breaks big complexes and Ming used Lacy EM grids. So here's an example of the Lacy EM grid. Um, you can see, or maybe you can't, um, but Ming has labeled with the little yellow stars for your advantage that even at low resolution, we're able to see the isosome filaments in, um, in the images. And so this allowed a targeted imaging approach um, with cryo -EM. Um, <clears throat> So I wanna point out that you can still, you can see it like this is his nicest image that had the most filaments in it in the whole data set. Um, but most of the images have many other contaminating proteins. And we still don't really know if there's a physical interaction between TORC2 and the isosomes, or if they're just a really visually compelling contaminant from these preps. So to process this data, we used helical reconstruction. Uh, we were actually able to get nine different filament structures that vary by diameter and helical symmetry. The diameters range from 310 to 370 angstrom. And when you unroll all of these helices and align them, you can see that the subunit interactions are exactly the same in all of the helix types. Perhaps you can see that maybe they're a little bit more stretched at the edges. So some, some types are more stretched than others. Um, but in practice, the different helix types have basically just meant that my data is divided by nine and it is limiting the resolution that I can achieve. But beyond looking at the protein lattice, what I mentioned, the most exciting part of the story is, is actually the lipid bilayer that's trapped inside the tubules. Um, because these were extracted in detergent-free 
buffers or relatively detergent-free buffers. We believe this represents the native plasma membrane that these proteins were attached to when they were isolated. So it seems we've captured this microdomain in our EM samples. Um, okay, so I decided to build a PIL-1 structure into this, even though what I have here is presumably a mixture of PIL-1 and LSP-1 proteins. Um, PIL-1 is essential for the isosomes, while LSP-1 is not, and they share a high sequence conservation. Um, and the places in which they diverge can't be built anyways. <clears throat> they're too flexible. So what we could see in our structure um, that was, oh, let me start the video for you. So here, here's my model that I was able to build into the structure. So what we can see from our structure beyond this banana shaped um, bar domain is that there's actually an amphipathic helix that um, is inserted into the membrane lipid. And we can also see that from the amphipathic helix towards the end terminus, there's some additional uh, protein that comes out and sits between the PIL-1 dimers. So using this model, I was able to calculate the surface charge as was done with the LSP model. And like them, I see these dense positive surface charge um, sites at two places in the membrane facing side of the PIL-1 dimer. So because PIL-1 and LSP-1 are known to tubulate membranes that contain PIP-2, and there's also a nebulous literature on the role of isosomes in regulating the uh, localization and turnover of PIP-2 in vivo, I suspected that this would be an ideal site for a PIP-2 head group, um, a negatively charged PIP-2 head group to bind. And when I looked at the maps, I actually saw that there was some extra unassigned density in the green here. Um, coordinated by positively charged side chains. Um, so because of the charge of this pocket and the relationship of the isosome to PIP2, I fit an IP2 group into this density to represent this putative PIP2 head group. But of course, I don't really have the resolution in this um, blobby density to claim either the orientation or um, the identity or how many PIP2 molecules are in this, um, in this binding pocket. So to improve my resolution, I used a symmetry expansion strategy. Um, so what I've done here is I apply a helical, or, uh, sorry, a spherical mask to every subunit with the center of the mask at the amphipathic helix. And then I use um, density subtraction to subtract all of the density outside of that sphere. And I do this for each subunit. Then I combine all of those into a pile um, and now I can process this data set like I would a single particle data set. So um, by doing this, I expand my particle number from tens to hundreds of thousands to 1.2 million particles. And I was able to improve my resolution to around 3.2 angstroms. Um, so this was great and it gave us a massive, a massive improvement in resolution. But actually what I'm really excited about is it enables us to use the three classification methods that are so powerful in crowd EM. And so let's see if this video plays, it struggles. Yes, okay. So what I'm showing you here is an example of what we can do with this data now. So this is one component of a 3D variability analysis. And so I hope what you can see is a really spring-like flexibility um, that's focused on these lattice contact sites. Can you see it? Yeah. So I've highlighted the lattice contact sites in green. So hopefully you can see it, but if not, um, what, what you see here is that there's a stretching that corresponds what I think would, would correspond to the flattening of the isosomes in response to membrane stress. Have pushed it too far, it doesn't wanna change slides. All right, all right, back. Okay, so now if we turn that map around and look at the membrane facing side. We can see something very nice. So um, I, let me point out what I've highlighted at least. So the green is these N-terminal lattice contact sites, which I pointed out earlier, are coming out 
of the amphipathic helix. The pink is the amphipathic helix. And I have a red circle around what I claim is the PIP2 uh, density. And so if this video ever plays, then what I hope you will see is that as these contact sites stretch, the, the density of the PIP2 changes. You see it sort of shrinks and grows. And um, so one thing I'm interested in is whether the stretching affects the binding of lipids at this site. So I also wanna show you another, and I think this is the most interesting feature of the membrane in these tubules. So <clears throat> what I've done in these images is I've turned my isosome tubules on their sides <coughs> and I've cut sagittally through them. And um, so here in this red box, what you can see if you look in the very center is this is the amphipathic helix embedded in the membrane. And you can actually see that these diagonal densities are the lipid binding pocket densities. And this dots exactly across from each other are the N-terminal uh, lattice contact sites coming back out of the membrane. So if you keep going lower and lower through the slices, what you can see is there's actually a pattern of holes in the membrane. Um, and this continues through the inner leaflet to which the protein is bound. But then if you continue slicing through to the outer leaflet, it's actually quite smooth. So I think that suggests that the distortion that I'm seeing in the membrane here is caused by the protein. And um, it's pretty exciting because I think it's a really uh, entirely different um, and unexpected visualization of the effect that the scaffolding protein would have on the the lipid behavior. But what's actually going on here? Why do we see these holes? So one possibility is that what we're seeing is a signature of sterols, which have a weaker electron density than the highly dense acyl tails of the lipids. Another possibility is that this is somehow caused by the binding of the PIP2, uh, trapping them in an unusual conformation, perhaps. Um, but at this point, I was kind of stuck how can I continue to investigate what's happening in this membrane? So we got a suggestion from Orlean Ru in the biochemistry department to try comparing our native isosomes with isosomes that we reconstitute um, using lipids of a known composition. So we started this collaboration with RuLab and we got purified pill one from Markle and reconstituted with liposomes of known composition with Javi and Markle. Um, we tried very many combinations, um, but these were the ones that uh, gave the, the best tubulation, um, gave enough tubules to collect cryo-EM data with. So I, I'm calling this one cholesterol only um, because my base lipids are always going to be DOPC, DOPS, and DOPE. Um, and then this is with 30% cholesterol. And then I have my PIP2 only, which has again, DOPC, DOPS, and DOPE and then 10% brain PIP2. So I was able to collect large data sets at DCI Lausanne. Um, and here are the tubules. So for my cholesterol only samples, I was able to get three different helix types ranging in diameter from 330 to 350 angstrom. And for my PIP2 samples, I got more helix types. I had five ranging from 320 to 365 angstrom. So the first thing I wanted to look at with these samples is what was going on in my region of interest near the amphipathic helix. So here's my native amphipathic helix density. And what I can see for the same slice in the um, PIP2 only sample, um, I have a weaker amphipathic helix density. But in the cholesterol only, um, I see none. Either the um, amphipathic helix doesn't insert or it's what's more likely is it's totally mobilized in these samples. So I think it's a pretty clear confirmation that PIP2 is a necessary component of the, um, of the native samples to produce the signature of the amphipathic helix that we see in those samples. So I think it's a nice confirmation that our native structures are bound to PIP2. However, in the PIP2 only samples, what you, what you, uh, and what I hope you can see is that the lipid density below the amphipathic helix doesn't seem to have any patterning. So um, the PIP2 alone is insufficient to cause the whole pattern that we saw 
in the native samples, or let's say the PIP2 plus DOPE, DOPC, and DOPS. So next, I wanted to check if my resolution had improved enough to assign a PIP2 head group unequivocally to my lipid density. And here's that PIP2 density in the reconstituted samples um, from different angles. I've highlighted it in this sort of like dark green color. Um, so what you can see is that it has a nice triangular shape, um, very much more like a PIP2 head group than my previous blobby density. Um, and we were also able to orthogonally confirm some PIP2 binding with Javi from RULAB, who also reconstituted PIL1 in his system. So here he has tubules of lipid that contain fluorescent PIP2 and fluorescent DOPC with PIL1 protein bound. And so what he sees here is that the PIL1 uh, constricts the membrane. You can see it in the DOP, the, the constrictions that correspond to the PIL1. Um, but there's more sorting of PIP2 into those membrane constrictions than DOPE. And here he has the quantification of that. So I can, I can confirm that there is PIP2 binding to my PIL1 proteins. But <clears throat> I did notice something odd in my structures, which is um, the density of the reconstituted PIP2 is pretty significantly different from the native density. Um, so the, in the native density, the, the fit that I got for a PIP2 head group was up here. Do you see my mouse? Yeah. Then um, obviously that is not where it fits in the reconstituted sample. However, maybe you can uh, see from these images that this uh, reconstituted density can fit into perhaps half of the native density. So here's the overlay between the fitted head group in the native um, in the light green and the reconstituted in the dark green. Um, so this was a puzzle for us because you can see that the reconstituted model actually does fit very well into the density, but the original fit um, of the PIP2 into the native density clashes with it. So I don't think it's possible for two PIP2 molecules to coexist in this density. So what is it that we're seeing in these native samples? Is the binding site binding to multiple lipids? Are there two mutually exclusive PIP2 binding sites? So to answer this question, and also the one about the membrane patterning, why that wasn't present in my PIP2 reconstitution, I decided to reconstitute with yet another combination of lipids. So this one is including 10% PIP2 and 15% cholesterol. So here I got six structures with a diameter range of 310 to 360. And here, if we look at the amphipathic helices, you can see that the combination of PIP2 and cholesterol has really increased the, um, the, the, the strength of the density of the amphipathic helix. So here's the PIP2 only, and here is the PIP2 plus cholesterol. So that's, quite interesting that this probably represents something more native-like because the structures are more resembling the native ones. Um, the other thing that I was super excited about, and it's impossible to see on the screen. <laughs> yep, sorry. <laughs> You're gonna have to believe me. You can come up here afterwards if you don't. <laughs> but what I saw was that the um, membrane hole patterning returned in these um, cholesterol samples. So the membrane hole patterning was present if I combined PIP2 and cholesterol. So <clears throat> I mentioned that I was looking for a solution to what's this extra piece of um, density in my native samples. And so um, I checked out the lipid density that occupies that pocket in the PIP2 cholesterol reconstituted samples. And <clears throat> So compared to the reconstituted samples, I see a super nice uh, PIP2 density, but also this extra unassigned density. And it kind of, but also doesn't represent, so it fits within, but does not explain all of the native isosome lipid density. And I also don't know what the identity of this density is. It's just this little blob. And so it's possible that it's cholesterol because that's the thing that I've added to this sample. But it could also be that the cholesterol enabled now a binding of one of the other lipids in the sample 
for instance, PS that is also charged or PE that has uh, a conical shape. So the answer to what this extra density uh, is has yet to be resolved. Um, but regardless, uh, we have some additional nice data from the in vitro collaborators. So these are experiments done by Marco. And what he's doing here is checking the, um, the binding of PIP2 to the um, PIL1 sites, to, to PIL1 um, under different uh, lipid composition conditions. And so in this movie, this is the control. You see what he's doing is he's frapping. So um, he bleaches uh, an area and then watches the lipid recover. Um, and if he does the same in an area that's covered with pill one, um, it's quite obvious that the recovery is much slower. And so he tested conditions of always the PIP2 being fluorescent and plus and minus the protein and plus and minus cholesterol. And basically he showed that when there's pill one protein there, the recovery is very slow, regardless of whether or not there's cholesterol. But he also did another very interesting experiment where in this condition, the fluorescent lipid is, um, is, is the cholesterol. And so here he bleaches and checks to see what the difference in the cholesterol recovery is, depending on whether there's PIL1 protein or PIP2 there. And so he sees in the green that there's a small decrease in the recovery kinetics of the cholesterol just by having the PIL1 protein there. Um, and in the red, what's amazing is by adding both PIL1 and PIP2, he sees a much slower recovery of the uh, cholesterol into that site. So what this means is that by PIP2 binding PIL1, it creates a lipid lattice that alters the sterile dynamics in the isosomes. So um, I wanted to present some sort of model of the isosome membrane microdomain, but at this point, we're still in, in this sort of like, we have a lot of really cool observations that tell us about what the structure of this is. So we know that the pill one forms a lattice at the membrane and that PIP2 binding to pill one leads to a patterning of PIP2 in the membrane. This alters the sterile dynamics within that um, microdomain that pill one creates. And we can see how those sterile dynamics are altered in our uh, cryo-EM structures. Um, what would be really nice is to be able to make some sort of claim about how this affects the isosome resident proteins. So maybe um, by, by creating this lattice or by allowing PIP2 to dynamically come in and out, um, it has an effect on the membrane thickness or an order to disorder transition in this region. And that could have an effect on whether the proteins stay or go. So that remains to be determined. But um, at this point, our future directions are to um, run some MD simulations to verify the PIP2 and sterile binding um, and the dwell times of those molecules. Uh, we want to see what the effects of mutations are at the PIP2 and sterile binding sites in vivo. And I really would like to identify that mystery lipid in my PIP2 cholesterol samples um, because I think it might tell us something about the structure of this domain as well. And the last thing would be to try and use a physiological like stimulus um, in vitro, like osmotic shock or membrane tension to try and alter either the PIP2 binding or the sterile dynamics in the reconstituted PIL1 tubules so that maybe we could say something about what the effect is um, that causes the isosome resident proteins to come and go. And so with that, I have lots of people to thank. Thank you all the people in the Lowest Lab, especially Ming, for accidentally finding this contaminant. And uh, also for all of the work that he's done to try and characterize since then why he's getting this contaminant. Um, I have uh, been collaborating with Amboise de Foss at the IBS in Grenoble to um, learn how to do the helical reconstruction. Um, obviously, Orléans Roux's lab is a major collaborator for us, especially Javier and Marco. 
And um, we also have a molecular dynamics collaboration with Stefano Vani's lab at Uni Fribourg. Um, and Josephine Alba is our collaborator um, running the simulations there. Um, I have to thank all the microscope facilities and my funding. And with that, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you for the amazing talk. Is there any questions? I do. And uh, I was wondering in the time that you want from the chemistry. Yeast. Oh, the one from the bacteria that we constituted samples. Yeah, so and if you purify the pill one from yeast, or so, sorry, from bacteria, like you, you just overexpress, then it forms filaments with no lipid inside. So it's if you just put the, those proteins on a grid, then you see long, thin filaments. Um, and it's only by adding the exogenous lipids that we see these large tubules with lipid inside. In the native part, you see the density uh, that's like coming over this group, okay? And you see what I mean? And yep. you see also this in the in vitro when you add both to the cholesterol. Yes, yeah, there you will not see your density in the group of this. No, so the the densities look quite different. So I see this separation between the two in the reconstituted sample until it blows up and and I only see um, you know the the noise of the membrane. So it still looks somehow different. I guess there could be a, a resolution difference um, in these two samples. I have like a um, yeah, I think I have a resolution of around the let's say three eight here and closer to three six here but it shouldn't really be so so much that i get this clear segregation so let's say it overlaps with but does not explain all of the density that i see in the native not yet. <laughs> You'd have to ask Javi about that. So it's a, we still don't know. I mean, we have run the telephone, like the see and so on, and they can see the case. This is this, this we color it. So, uh, for example, for the, for the sorting, we are, we are analyzing the sorting data, and it says that it could be that the other negative is a thing, for example, they color the Whereas, for example, cholesterol, we said it is very sweet. So it seems to be the it seems to be in the, in the regions of the constituent parts of the host, they are the host, actually, or they from the host, but they are not the bricks. So I do so maybe they cluster somehow in the constituent parts, but they don't they are not being bricks, there is no sorting. So it sounds I guess you will confuse, but like yes. So how do you think that also occurs with the Yeah. So <clears throat> one of the ideas that I am excited about. So there was a paper published in BioArchive like late last year that um, implies that the Tetraspanin family SIR7 is responsible for uh, preventing the tubulation of the of of the pill one LSP1 lattice, that somehow it either through um, its effect on the membrane or um, some sort of protein protein interaction um, is it lines the edge, like the, the membrane surface of, of the isosome um, invagination. Um, and if you delete it, then you get tubules instead of half pipes. Um, so, one of the possibilities that we've been thinking about for why we get so many isosomes and intact ones in our prep is the possibility that like, this is something that actually happens in the cells that the SIR7 leaves and causes this tubulation um, under membrane stress conditions. So maybe that's why we, we get this contaminant in our preps, but I think that will be difficult to prove. There's this, uh, 
for a much lower resolution. But that's it. Could I? The, 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 mm, the resolution is much lower. I mean, yeah. in the sense that, like, they are um, the the correct depth and and. I, I can't say anything about length with my processing actually, but the 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 width of the tubules is compatible with the depth of the isosomes in in situ cryolia. Why, why do they stretch? Um, so the function of the isosome seems to be, so like there's a couple of nice stories of the proteins that are resident there. So my favorite one at the moment is, um, besides the slim one, which I already told you, is the APC nutrient transporters are sequestered in the isosomes under steady state conditions. And so if they are not in the isosomes, then they are rapidly endocytosed. So the isosomes serve to protect these from endocytosis, but under membrane stress, um, these guys are released. And so perhaps it's uh, what they're functionally doing is signaling, okay, we're stressed. So now you guys who are backup proteins that would otherwise be causing problems are free to do your functions. So that would be a way that membrane stress would signal something useful to those proteins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be very nice to try and reconstitute one of the, for example, the NCE tetraspanin family with the pill one lattice to see if there's a condition where we can make it stay or leave. So besides uh, the generation of neural curvature, so is there any evidence in that this proteins would also like promote some sort of stabilization and and, and like vision, the or the of so there's nice evidence that they are not involved in endocytosis, okay. that they are non-overlapping. So all of the sites of endocytosis are non-overlapping with the isosomes. So I guess that's one answer. But the other is this, uh, this cool thing with the SIR7 proteins. So if these things that are apparently involved in keeping them as half pipes instead of tubules, leave, then they tubulate, and whether that has a function in vivo or not is not known. But they would still remain attached to the membrane in that case. Uh, is this a generation of curvature that is the, so before they polymerize and they, they, they constrict that with the membrane, uh, as a monomer, or as a monomer units, do they have membrane remodeling capabilities? As the individual subunits? Yeah, like they said, they are able to set spots, for example, or I have no idea. I'm not sure how you would measure that. Is it sort of, I guess the um, molecular dynamic simulations are attempting to do this? Yeah, it is true. Sure. <laughs> I'm not. Yeah, because your product likes actually to as well. Hmm. It's true. It does. And in fact, there's some evidence that in the absence of the NCE, NCE family proteins, that the isosomes are flat. They are still a lattice of PIL1 and LSP1, but without the NCE family, then they don't form the invagination. Okay, so if there is no more questions, I think it's time for pizza. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So it's been nice to since you my Yes. Yeah, no, so I'm excited about the idea of... Uh, Is anything from the Like, you stop... Uh,